is one of the oldest sayings in politics. You got to dance with them what brung you. And what it means is that when you get to when you get to office, when you get to public office, you vote with the folks who put you there. And that used to mean your constituents, the people who voted for you. But more and more what it means is you vote with the special interests who put up the money to get you to public office. And part of what this book is about is the corruption of the American political system by money. It's not as though American politics had ever been pristine and pure. Of course not. Money has always been there. But money nowadays is the dominant factor by such an enormous margin that I think it is making not just a qualitative, but a, not just a quantitative, but a qualitative difference in American politics. It's a pickup truck. It's just a picture of me in a pickup truck. Sure. And down in Austin, Texas, right near where I live, I drive a pickup truck myself, but that is not my pickup truck. That's an old one. They love some kind of Texas connection. They always like to put something up on the cover that reminds people that I'm a Texan. Well, good Lord, there's a question. Um, I think my own feeling is that Texans uh, are just like everybody else, only more so. Uh, that there is a sw slight quality of exaggeration, a slightly larger-than-life pie-eyed quality about the whole state that makes it a lot of fun. I love to tease Lubbock. Um, it's out in West Texas, and it's just uh, as flat as a pancake, and I must say, to the uninitiated eye, it does not appear to be one of the world's more attractive cities, but that's because you don't know the people there. They are just as straightforward and open-hearted and good as they can be. That, I believe that's right. Of course it's true. You can't make up stuff like that, and you never need to make up anything in Texas because bizarre and strange things just always happen as a matter of course. Uh, East Texas is the very southern part of the state. In fact, I sometimes think that East Texas is more like the Old South than the Old South is anymore. Um, uh, about 50% of the population there is black. It was uh, uh, plantation, cotton farming part of, this, part of the state. But West Texas is a totally different kettle of fish. It's the dry, ranching part of the state. Uh, a lot of, there are a fair number of Hispanics and in West Texas and in South Texas now they're, they're the majority. But that looks, the western part of the state looks more like what you would think of Texas in a, in a cowboy movie. The opening of every day in the session, we have prayer and we need it, the ledge. It gets too long to write legislature every time you need to talk about what they've been up to. Actually, a lot of people around the ledge call it the ledge. Bob Bullock, the national politician of Texas. He is a piece of work. The lieutenant governor of the state of Texas. Uh, he's been around since God was a pup. He was, uh, before he was like Gov, he was um, state comptroller. And under our constitution, like most southern states, we have a weak governor system, so that the lieutenant governor is the guy who really has the clout. And Bob Bullock is one of the smartest, shrewdest, toughest, and sometimes meanest politicians I have ever known. He's a remarkable piece of work. He's been sober for quite some time. He went to whiskey school out in California many years ago. Uh, but before that, he was a roarer, and uh, he drank just an enormous amount. And as people who drink a lot uh, do, he would uh, not infrequently get himself into trouble. And one time, uh, one of his early wives, he used to get married a lot too, um, kicked him out of the house, we assume for good cause, and he went over to stay with a friend of his. But his friend was in turn out drinking, and Bob couldn't get into that apartment, but he spotted his friend's car in the alley behind the apartment. So he opened the back door and crawled into the back seat and fell asleep in the back seat of the car. He woke up the next morning, and the car was being driven down the highway by a total stranger. It was not his friend's car at all, and there was Bob in the back seat thinking about how to handle this, and Finally, he just sat bolt upright and said to the end of the driver's ear, Hi there, I'm Bob Bullock, your Secretary of State. That's a true story. And he's still Lieutenant Governor. Um, I think it's much ado about nothing. Um, the, I was, the idea that somehow this is uh, some kind of police come down upon you if you use words that are offensive, uh, I think is nonsense. It seems to me that political correctness was... Uh, is maybe just an attempt to codify good manners or kindness. You don't go around using words that offend people, uh, if you have any sense at all. On the other hand, um, to 
prissy up language seems to me always a mistake. I like language that's strong and earthy and vigorous and salty. I like to use the full range of the English language. Hairy-legged women, them hairy-legged women. He does that all the time to annoy us, of course. Yeah. Right. In Texas, I think of necessity. We have a larger tolerance for, um, for uh, politicians who uh, are not politically correct. I mean, we could wait a long darn time before we found one who uh, always spoke as we wanted. Womperjaw, that just left him womperjaw. That means with his mouth not only open, staring in amazement, but so amazed he kind of, like you can say of a suitcase, when you mess up the lid to the body of the suitcase, that your suitcase is womperjawed. It means just astonished. Left him womperjaw. No, oh, no, well, it's an old Texas word. Slime balls, well, it seems to me that that is a word in great general use. And, and a useful word it is because there are many of them hanging around. People with no ethics, no integrity, just total slime balls. Good on you. That's, uh, that's another old Texas expression. Good on you, you can even say it. It's, it's approbation. It's, um, it's uh, encouragement. You're doing right. Well, she was, uh, had been defeated at that point. She uh, lost uh, the governorship to George W. Bush, and I wrote a column about the four years she was in office, and uh, it, it's my judgment that Ann Richards was an awfully good governor. And uh, so I think I close that column by saying good on you. Well, as I say, in our state we have the weak governor system, so that uh, really not a great deal is required of the governor. Um, not necessary to know much or do much, and we've had a lot of governors who did neither. Uh, Anne, I think, was one of our more effective governors, although in the odd way of American politics, um, I'm not sure I could point to a whole lot that she actually got done. It was mostly a matter of keeping bad things from happening. One of the main reasons she lost the governorship was because she vetoed the concealed handgun bill. And we've got a bunch of gun nuts in Texas who are bound to determine that they should be able to march around with uh, concealed weapons. Somebody who loves guns loves guns, think that that's just the most important thing in the whole world. No, lots of them. There are people who are crazy about guns. Um, I have never, um, I don't hunt myself, but I, I know, sure do know a lot of people who do, and I've never thought, especially in a, in a state like Texas, where there's an awful lot of outdoors, uh, that it's ridiculous to uh, try and take away long guns, but I've never seen any use in a, in a in a society that is, what are we now, at least 70% urban, what is the point of a handgun? What is the point of letting people have handguns? It's just endless tragedy after endless tragedy because of these things. They're little machines designed to do nothing but kill people. And the amount of people in this, number of people in this country who get liquored up or have no sense to begin with, get furiously angry and go and kill one another, I just think it's ridiculous. That's the way Texans say government. And that government, you know, we've got to get the government off our backs, got to get the government off our, you know, that's the way people talk. I just write the way people talk. I don't invent this stuff. Yes. That's exactly the way Texans say the word business. Business. When I'm, I'm not sure I could say all anymore. We've got a lot of Texans who've moved in from somewhere else, but anyway, almost anyone who's a native will say that. Business. Some bitch is not uh, a dirty word in Texas. It's not like SOB. Uh, a son bitch is the Texas word for fella or guy. Well, he's a good old son bitch. And then that added son bitch said to me, he said, and there's no, there's no offense intended. Boy, I don't even remember snurf. Yeah, Sometimes I do make up words, actually. Luckless fellows, you luckless fellow. I did make that word up. It just sounds right. Oh, well, not hatch is a fine insult. Um, referring to uh, someone being a little bit loosely wrapped, someone being a little... Perhaps not having a firm grip on reality. You know, when you write about Texas politics, it is necessary to find words that are highly descriptive. Ah, garbanzo brains, right? Bean brains, tiny, tiny, tiny brains. It's a bean. It's a bean. I don't know. Gazoonies, another word. I'll tell you, the, the uh, need you have for descriptive terms for stupid when you write about Texas politics is practically infinite. Now. I'm not claiming that our state legislature is uh, dumber than the average state legislature, but it tends to be dumb in such an outstanding way. It's, again, that Texas quality of exaggeration and being slightly larger than life. 
And there are a fair number of people in the Texas legislature um, of whom it can fairly be said if dumb was dirt, they would cover about an acre. And um, I'm not necessarily opposed to that. I'm, I agree with an old state senator who always said that if you took all the fools out of the legislature, it would not be a representative body anymore. That's right. Seems to me if you're going to do something, if you're really going to get something done, you're going to tick somebody off pretty seriously. And I am more and more persuaded that politics itself is the art of finding that thin, tiny sliver of daylight in the huge wall of obstruction that prevents anything from getting done about anything. I live in Austin, Texas, the state capital. Since, uh, let's see, this go around since about 85, 86. I had lived in Austin earlier. Uh, I was editor, co-editor of the Texas Observer back in the 70s. No, I'm from East Texas originally. Where? I went to high school in Houston, Texas. Well, I sort of fell into it backwards. Uh, when I was coming up, uh, about the only talent I ever showed, aside from basketball, which looked like it would be pretty hard to make a living doing that, uh, was for writing. And uh, I loved to read. And my only interest, my big interest love besides literature was politics. So I sort of fell naturally backwards into journalism. Combine writing and politics and there you are with journalism. Well, um, my first political involvement was in the civil rights movement. Um, well, I came along at a time when if you were young and idealistic and in the South, that was, you pretty much were drawn to that. My family is quite conservative. My father is, uh, I would say, extremely conservative. Yes, he is. My mama, bless her heart, um, passed on. I th sometimes think it may have been my mother's fault. My mother tried. She, she would certainly uh, assure you, without success, to drill good manners into my head. And in some ways, I think that manners are just a formal expression of how you treat people. And in the way black people were treated before the civil rights movement, it was clear to me, was very wrong. It was an easy call. Yeah, um, both Republicans, lifelong. My mama was ditzy, there's no question about it. She truly was. She was absent-minded. She was uh, fuzzy about the practical details of life. To, and, and, and it, of course, it made for some hilarious stories, and we loved to tease her. Yep. Horrible. Mm -hmm. my, my mother had her druthers, so she would not be up and bustling about doing things. She <laughs> liked to sit a lot, watch television, eat, talk. Uh, she enjoyed people. She was an absolute charmer. Three kids, and um, my sister is now teaching school in Albuquerque, New Mexico. My brother's a lawyer in Bernie, Texas. Smith, it's a good school. I really do think I got a good education at Smith. I was... Uh, not, I, I'm not one of those people who thinks of my college years as a happy golden time. I mean, I was a Texan who was up in Massachusetts. I, first of all, I was cold. I mean, I was <laughs> freezing to death the whole time I was up there. Uh, and I found uh, Yankees rather, in some ways, chilly and difficult compared to the Texans I was used to. But I do think I got an awfully good education. Grateful for it. History. My major was history. Six years with the New York Times. Um, some of it in New York, as a political reporter at City Hall in Albany, and then later as bureau chief out in the Rocky Mountains. Ah, now, there is something that, uh, when I'm in standing in the checkout line at the grocery store, and if I really need to impress people, I just let fall that I covered Elvis's funeral. And, uh, boy, people just practically draw back with awe. It may yet turn out to be my greatest claim to fame. Um, I was sitting in the New York City Times one day when I noticed a whole knot, knot of editors up around the desk uh, having a, a great scrum of concern. You could tell it looked sort of like an anthill that had just been stepped on. And it turned out the New York Times has a large obituary desk and they prepare obituaries for anybody of prominence who might croak. But it turns out you may recall that Elvis Presley died untimely and they were completely unprepared. Now this is an enormous news organization. So they have rock music critics and classical music critics and opera critics, but they didn't have anybody who knew about Elvis Presley's kind of music. 
So they're looking across a whole acre of reporters, and uh, you could see them decide, aha, Ivan's. She talks funny. She'll know about Mr. Presley. So I wound up writing Elvis's obituary for the New York Times. I had to refer to him throughout as Mr. Presley. It was agonizing. That's the style at the New York Times, Mr. Presley. Give me a break. And the next day, they sold more newspapers than they did uh, after John Kennedy was assassinated, so that even the editors of the New York Times, who had not quite, you know, been culturally attuned to Elvis, decided that we should send someone to report on the funeral. And now uh, I drew that assignment. What a scene it was. That's exactly what he said. Same Elvis had to die while the Triners are in town, and I kind of raised my eyebrows, and sure enough, I realized what he, what he meant after I'd been there for a while. Because, you know, Shriners in convention, I don't know if you've ever seen a whole lot of Shriners in convention, but uh, they were having a huge national convention that very week in Memphis. And uh, they tend to wear their little red fezzes, and sometimes they drink too much, and they uh, march around the hotel hallways tooting on New Year's Eve horns and riding those funny little tricycles and generally cutting up and having a good time. That's your Shriners in convention, always something very edifying and enjoyable to watch. But they, every, every hotel room in Memphis was occupied with uh, celebrating Shriners and then Elvis dies and all these tens of thousands of grieving hysterical Elvis Presley fans descend on the town. So you got a whole bunch of sobbing hysterical Elvis fans, you got a whole bunch of cavorting Shriners. And on top of that, they were holding a cheerleading camp. And uh, the cheerleading camp, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the ethos of the cheerleading camp, but the deal is that Every school sends its team, team of cheerleaders to cheerleading camp, and your effort there at the camp is to win the spirit stick, which looks to the uninitiated eye a whole lot like a broom handle painted red, white, and blue, but it is the spirit stick. And should your team win it for three days running, you get to keep it, but that has never happened. And the way you earn the spirit stick is you show most spirit. You cheer for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You cheer when the pizza man brings the pizza. You do handsprings end over end down the hallway to the bathroom. I tell you, those young people will throw show of an amount of spirit that would just astonish you in an effort to win that stick. So here I was for an entire week dealing with these three groups of people. The young cheerleaders trying to win the spirit stick, the cavorting Shriners, and the grieving hysterical Elvis fans. And I want to assure you that the New York Times is not the kind of newspaper that will let you write about that kind of rich human comedy. Because the New York Times, at least in my day, was a very stuffy, pompous newspaper. Uh, a little bit better, a little bit better than it was. Has, it, has, it has a tendency, recidivist tendencies, though. You, you will notice if you read the Times that it lapses into pomposity and stuffiness with some regularity. Well, um, I, uh, I actually got into trouble at the New York City Times uh, for describing a community ch chicken killing out west as a gang pluck. Abe Rosenthal was then the editor of the Times, and he was not amused. Oh, no, it never made it in the paper. Good heavens, no, such a thing would never get in the Times in my day. I was just sort of put on the, on the, uh, on the S list, we used to call it at the Times. The shit list, what the hell, these people are grown-ups. Well, I just, I decided that I didn't have enough a time in my life to waste uh, trying to get off the New York Times shit list over a silly thing like that. And I got a call from uh, the Dallas Times Herald, uh, and what they said was, come home and we will give you absolute freedom. You can write whatever you want, about whatever you want to, and you can say whatever you want to. And you know, in the newspaper business, it doesn't get a lot better than that. Almost never, almost never. And, and uh, if they changed anything, um, I would, they would bring it to me and I would look at it and say, you're absolutely right, let's change that. Um, since 1990, three times. That's, a, that's not at all unusual in our business. These giant media corporations keep merging and merging and, and you keep getting bought by somebody else and somebody else. The single meanest line I ever heard said about anybody. Roy Cohn, the late Roy Cohn, was, in my opinion, one of the most despicable human beings who ever lived. He was... Uh, a ruthless lawyer and a shameless 
human being, and I know that he has friends still living, but I'm, I'm entitled to my opinion, too. I think Roy Cohn was one of the most despicable people who ever lived. And he was, in fact, Cy Newhouse's lawyer, the lawyer of this great magnate, this uh, media magnate, Newhouse. I never worry about biting the hand that feeds me. I'm, I, you know, I realize that's an old saying, but um, I think you're much better off telling the truth. Why would a, you know, why, I've never worried about offending the powers that be. Same, same like uh, my old deal with the Times Herald. They, we, we just, every, if they have a problem, they bring it to me, and I almost always agree that whatever they think needs to be changed needs to be changed, but it rarely happens. Last year, 1997, I got to teach at the University of California at Berkeley um, just for one quarter, I, and it was the first time I'd ever really taught, and I loved it. Of course, I'm going to make fun of it. I mean, Berkeley, California, if you are from Texas, is just hilarious. Well, of course, it is just the absolute center of uh, liberalism and political correctness, and it is a veritable hotbed of uh, people uh, of, um, bless their hearts, who all think alike in a liberal way. And, of course, I'm sometimes called a liberal myself, and uh, you would think I would have felt right at home there, but I just am so used to <laughs> I'm so used to Texas that I found the culture of Berkeley hysterical. They are local characters there in Berkeley. One guy walks around with no clothes on. He's the naked man. And the other guy wears nothing but pink. It is just, he wears nothing but pink, and everybody knows him. There's the pink man. It's the kind of community where people like that are rather relished and cherished. The Birkenstocks are those, those famous uh, sandals that, um, they're, they're good for your feet. Um, they're, they're not fashion sandals, they're, they're, they're kind of squat-looking uh, sandals that uh, hippies and people, uh, people with foot trouble wear. And of course, Berkeley being full of people who are far too sensible uh, to uh, ruin their feet by walking around in high heels, there are a lot of folks who wear those sandals there. Very, very bright people. Um, I was really pleased. I had thought, like many people in our business, I've been sort of grumpy um, about young people coming into journalism recently because it seems to me we've gotten an awful lot of ambitious little careerists and I keep looking at them and thinking to myself, damn, why didn't they go into investment banking? Um, but the, uh, the students I found at Berkeley were not just bright but idealistic to a remarkable degree. Well, they're going to have some of it ground out of them. There's no question about that. Um, but it's my hope that they'll stay with it long enough to make a difference. Well, part of it is an old tradition in the newspaper business, as is true in many others. There is a sort of tradition that, um, I, I call it the Marine Corps mentality. You know, listen to the sun. I ate chip when I was young, and you can do it too. It'll make a man out of you. It'll put hair on your chest. I mean, the idea that you should somehow, uh, as part of making someone pay their dues, uh, put them through a bad time. And I think it's a terrible mistake. One of the things we still do in the newspaper business is take bright, talented, idealistic young people and give them the world's worst, most boring assignments. We make them write obituaries or some boring thing. Why not take them and put them immediately on some big series where they, you could use all that energy and idealism. Um, I've always thought that was a mistake, the way we treat young people in our business, and it's true in a lot of fields. It's funny, people will get upset at what they, they think is vulgar language, forgetting that words often have dual meanings. And what I was, that, the reason I made that point in the column is because I do think that context is everything. And this was in, in uh, a column about criticism and indeed censorship of a television program from which snippets had been taken that made it look as though it were some, you know, very prurient, salacious program when actually it was a very fine and intelligent program. McNamara's book in which he essentially apologized for Vietnam and admitted that it was a terrible mistake it had just come out. And what interested me was the reaction. Uh, there were an extraordinary number of people who sort of refused to accept McNamara's apology. And I am of the Vietnam generation. It was a war I oppose very strongly. It's one of the most horrible events in the entire history of this nation. Um, mistake uh, is a word that barely 
covers uh, that tragedy. Um, but it seemed to me impossible not to accept and recognize McNamara's finally, painfully having come to the realization of, of not only having been wrong, but the terrible cost of having been that wrong. Robert Strange McNamara, that middle name was always telling, I thought. Um, I thought it was brave of him and right of him to have written that book and that he deserves to be commended for it. I think that Vietnam was a terribly destructive episode. And I'm, it's interesting to me as somebody who was young in the 60s to hear now the constant references to the 60s as though sex, drugs, and rock and roll were the only things that happened. Um, I was very, like many young people in the 60s, I was very political. And as far as I was concerned, the 60s were about first the Civil Rights Movement and then the anti-war movement. Um, and I miss sex, drugs, and rock and roll entirely. Damn, what a fool. Um, but it was a time I thought of great idealism, and then when, when uh, the country got dragged into Vietnam, I think it dragged a lot of people into despair and cynicism and nihilism because it was just so stupid. Yeah. Don't mind. A lot. I think that if you are in a position of political leadership and you don't question yourself, um, you're apt to go very wrong. I think a becoming degree of self-doubt is one of the best qualities we can look for in leaders. Yeah. But I think a lot of people are looking for certainty. They, they are very, very uncomfortable with the idea that things are never going to be cut and dried, that there's never going to be a set of rules that always apply. Um, I'd pick humor, of course. Um, well, I do think it's important, to, and, I, and I do try to write about politics in a way that makes people laugh. Now, there's two reasons for that. One is, politics is intrinsically funny, and, there, and this should be noted and appreciated by all. Um, and second, I think it's important we, in, in a time when people so look down on politics and are so reluctant to get involved or even learn very much about it. You know, I constantly hear people say things like, eh, politics, they're all crooks, who cares? Very dismissive. And it seems to me that in part that's because people who write and report about politics make it so boring. I mean, you read those newspaper articles that start, House Bill 327 was passed out of subcommittee by a unanimous vote on Tuesday. I mean, who wants to read any more than that? You take, I've seen reporters time and again take all the juice and joy and life and comedy and drama and humanity and excitement out of politics. They just wring it all out, clop, and what they leave you with is this dried set of lifeless fact that has, doesn't reflect at all the the whole splendid panorama that is politics. Every, every time we have a birthday in this country, I sort of write a column celebrating us. I like to do that. Isn't this wonderful? We do that all the time, always taking polls to find out how stupid we are, and then we sit there reading the polls going, oh my God, look at this. Oh, we're all so stupid. Isn't that wonderful? Is that such a comic thing for people to do? Because we're funny people. I swear that's true. I've been up to Canada. That is their national motto now. Let's not get excited. I was up there one time when they were having a national election that was practically a revolution. They threw out the party that was in power. They c completely took off a party that had been there forever, practically disappeared. A whole new set of folk came in, and all the commentators were there on election night saying, now, let's not get excited. <laughs> when they win the World Series, instead of cutting up and going wild and people downtown honking and dancing the way they would in America, so the Canadians always go, this is quite wonderful, but let's not get excited. Well, of course. Um, I think those are both important things. One is that, and I think it's the fault of people in our business, Brian, the media presents such a negative picture. We're, so, we're just so relentlessly negative. I don't think it's that the media are left-wing or right-wing, but they are negative. And that's partly the nature of the world. If you've ever noticed that 
Uh, the world news is always worse than the national news, and the national news is always worse than the state news, and the state news is always worse than the local news, and the local news is always worse than whatever has happened in your neighborhood that day. Well, of course, the world is pretty much like your neighborhood. The whole world is pretty much like your neighborhood. Not much horrible ever happens there. But the news business so focuses on the bizarre the disastrous and the unusual that people get the sense that the world out there is much more dangerous and dark than it actually is. The world's full of nice folks. And then my second point in that piece about the pursuit of happiness, um, people sometimes think that the pursuit of happiness is, um, you know, somehow it's written in the Constitution that we all have a right to go off on a great search for self-fulfillment and satisfaction and frisks and jollification. Uh, actually, that's about looking for a way to find justice. I believe that it to be absolutely true. Now, Minnesotans are a little tired of being called nice. Understandably so. They sort of wince. But the truth is, they're awfully nice in Minnesota. What about, like, the pyramids of ancient Egypt, like the Colosseum of ancient Rome? We have the Mall of America. It's been a couple of years now. What an amazing place. What a, what a great temple to consumption that is. Oh, there's a world of stuff at the Mall of America. You just hardly would not believe it. There's entire stores that sell nothing but barrettes and hair bows. There's stores that sell nothing but different kinds of popcorn. You would not believe the variety of stuff there is in this world. Well, now, there's a good question. Um, it's partly uh, because, uh, you know, in the capitalist system, they push you to consume, and an enormous amount of time, money, and skill is spent persuading us to buy things like pink lemonade and striped toothpaste, which are not exactly basic necessities in this world. Um, the amount of money spent on a single television ad uh, is frequently, a 30-second ad frequently costs more than the entire 30-minute program surrounding the ad. Tommy Fag Lover, yeah, I get a lot of those. Um, there are certain topics, I used to sort of say, well, there are certain topics that sort of rattle their cages. You're always going to hear from the haters. If you write about death penalty, abortion, um, i trying to think of some others. There's, there's a series of, of subjects that just always touch off the nutcases. And then I thought about it again, and I thought, Gosh, it's practically everything I write touches them off. Oh, yeah, gays, homosexuals, that, that sets them off, too. You bet. I tell you, you want to you stir things up and uh, get people screaming, you bring up God, gays, and guns in my state. <laughs> mean as hell with the hat off. Yeah, that's a certain kind. Just teeth rattling mean. Meaner than a skillet for rattlesnakes. We have them down in Texas because they'll do things that are gratuitously cruel in the name of conservatism, like, you know, cut milk for children or something that is, just makes no sense fiscally, because they're mean. There is, it's, it's always hard for me to identify the, uh, you know, I, I think this is true on the liberal side too, but the, the legitimate, thoughtful, philosophical, consistent conservatism, and there are a lot of conservatives I admire, I really do. Jim Kilpatrick seems to me to be a very thoughtful conservative, the writer James. Um, I find him consistently thoughtful and, um, and a very principled person. And I understand that political point of view, but to me, we've been getting more and more uh, people to the right of people that I always thought were very conservative, like Kilpatrick and Barry Goldwater. Now we've got people to the right of them who seem to think that, that government should be used in a punitive way against poor people. I mean, it's not just that they're opposed to welfare. It's like, let's really make sure these people never get a chance to get anywhere. I get, it's just so mean-spirited. Jesse Helms sets me off pretty bad. I'm, I just find him a, a mean-spirited person. Phil Graham, there's another one. He's, he's, um, there's something in addition to, to the mean-spiritedness, there's a kind of smarminess about Graham that I find distasteful. But then I don't like him, some people do. Now, now we're talking about my favorite trio of bozos. Um, Tom DeLay, Dick Armey, and Bill Archer are these three powerful Republican congressmen from Texas. And uh, I must say, of the three, DeLay is probably the only one who uh, <laughs> is actively stupid. 
the other two are really fairly bright. I just happen not to agree with them politically. Uh, but delay, sometimes you do have to question that man's sense. Oh, he, one of his ideas is that we should bring back DDT. He's, he's one of those people who thinks that uh, environmentalism is, is a, a, non, a nonsensical and pernicious thing. He wants to bring back DDT. <laughs> he used to be, be a bug exterminator in Sugar Land, Texas. That's what he did for a living. He exterminated bugs. And before he went into Congress. <laughs> Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, sure. He, he, he was in the Texas legislature for a while. He wasn't, I never thought he was that bad when he was in the legislature. He really seemed like a sort of regular vanilla Republican, but he certainly has taken on some strange coloration in Washington. He's a figure in a film called Being There, who is an opaque person into whom other people read whatever they want. In this figure, the Chauncey Gardner guy, conservatives think he's conservative, liberals think he's a liberal, um, you know, um, people read into him whatever they want to see there. And there is a touch of that about Bill Clinton. I think he's a politician. And I say that I may be one of the last people left in America who does not use that word as a pejorative. I like to watch politicians work. Remember when I was talking earlier about the art of politics being able to find this little thin sliver that allows you to get something done? Well, it gets harder and harder to get anything done about anything because our politics have gotten to be so headbutty and, and uh, people just going against one another out of knee-jerk reaction rather than concentrate on fi fixing a problem. And Clinton is good. And by that, I mean he can find a way to get things done. It's not necessarily the solution he'll finally get through. May not be the best way to fix the problem, may not be the most efficient or least costly, but it is the politically doable way. And that's, that's a great skill. That's actually a great art. Sure. Um, he's a politician. You know, like all politicians, he's a compromiser. And in my opinion, he compromises far too easily and far too often. He'll often give away nine-tenths of the loaf just to get one slice. Seems to me you ought to hold out for at least half. There is a bunch of people, uh, almost all of us women, but a couple of men go along too, and uh, we have been, for many years now, taking outdoor wilderness adventure trips together. And it started back in 1980 when a bunch of us did a whitewater raft trip out in Idaho. And every year that group, that group, it'll, it shifts some, some years, uh, some people can't go and other people come in. It's not, not exactly the same crowd every time, but uh, a bunch of us who, uh, I think when we started doing this, nobody was particularly important or, or any kind of a big cheese. Uh, we were, uh, 20 years ago, we were just young and funny and, and uh, enjoyed one another. And we got to where we, we'd almost every summer, we'd go on, on, a, on a trek in the Himalayas or climb Machu Picchu or take a kayak trip or get in Alaska. Or, we've done all kinds of wonderful things together and it, we really do have an awfully good time. It is sheer fun. Uh, you might think that, you know, with say a heavy hitter as members of the cabinet and this kind of thing on, all along on a trip, that we would sit around having deep philosophical conversations or weighty policy discussions, we revert to being complete 13-year-olds on this trip. We just giggle and really silly. Ah, that's a good question. They often do. Uh, uh, almost always they, they take them, start taking themselves quite seriously. They're still teasable. They're still teasable. Yeah, I do. Now, more in Donna than in Alice Rivlin. Alice Rivlin seems to me to have been, to be a wonderfully consistent human being. I think Donna Donna is the same good person she always was, and she's trying to, do, I think everything that she tries to do is good. I mean, I think all the policies are good, and of course she is remarkably effective in government. But I see, um, see in Donna a, um, I guess it's just used to, being used to dealing with people in your daily life who are, household names in the rest of the country. Sometimes you get the impression that she's so used to dealing with big names and big people and important people um, that maybe she's 
not hanging out enough time with people of no particular distinction but great delight. Well, he knows uh, perfectly well that my, uh, my opinions are uh, sort of on the left side of the political spectrum. I consider myself a populist rather than a liberal, but I'm not worth quarreling over. A populist? A populist is somebody who sees politics more from an economic perspective than an ideological perspective. I often argue that I don't think politics is a spectrum that runs from right to left. It's a scale that runs from top to bottom. And I think the only real political questions are who's getting screwed and who's doing the screwing. That, that does, I've, I've often wondered, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm glad my publisher called him and asked him for the blurb and that I didn't. I think it's bad policy for a journalist to owe a politician. I really do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Jim is one of the great Texas populists. You know, the populism started uh, in Texas. I mean, that's where the movement first came out of that thin, stony soil in the central hill country of Texas. And for years, uh, we had wonderful populist representatives, uh, Wright Patman in Congress and uh, Sam Rayburn, uh, Ralph Yarborough in the Senate. Uh, and uh, the best Texas politics were, uh, politicians were always at least part populist. But it's, uh, we'd, I don't think we have anyone in public office anymore who really counts as a Is true it? populist. Sure they did. He's, he carried water for the oil companies in the 1950s constantly. He was the senator from Texas Oil when he was in the Senate. Oh, yes. Uh, the, the, the Lord impersonation problem. This has worried me considerably. Right. I'm, I'm very fond of writing for small progressive magazines that pay in the high two figures. This is the kind of fiscal sanity that has made me the woman of great wealth that I am today. Okay. It's CAD claiming to be God. What happened was a bunch of folks from Floyd Data, Texas. Floyd Data. Floyd Data, Texas. It's up in the panhandle. It's a particularly undistinguished town. And um, a whole bunch of them uh, believed that the Lord had told them to get naked, get in the car, and drive to Louisiana. And they get as far as Vinton, Louisiana, and their car hits a tree. And to the absolute astonishment of the people who saw it happen, out of this car come about 20 naked people, including a bunch of kids who were stuck in the back. <laughs> I think it was more than 20. I can't remember the exact number. But there was just quite a few of them squashed all in there together. And uh, they explained, as they were standing there on the street in Vinton, Louisiana, with their car drove into the tree, that the Lord had told them to do this, which, of course, increased the astonishment of the police of Vinton, Louisiana, even more. And so I'm addressing this phenomenon by saying, you know, I do not believe it was the Lord who told them to do that. There is this fellow who runs around impersonating the Lord. And many a time people will tell you, God told me to do this. But it's that fellow who impersonates the Lord. It's not the Lord at all. It's a real problem. I find that all too often, especially those guys. Have you noticed how often People who used to be television weathermen now run for public office. They all have really good hair and no brains. Now, I don't mean to put down weathermen as a class, but uh, I'm sure there are redeeming uh, ex exceptions among the weathermen of the nation. But I just uh, am speaking of, of a common kind of weatherman. Um, I find uh, more and more that people who go into politics seem to me to Somehow, they don't have much depth, they don't have much fire, they, they, uh, Lord only knows what makes them run. There was a remarkable week in my life when, um, a bunch of Texas lunatics holed up out by Fort Davis, Texas, and demanded that, uh, Texas be allowed to secede from the rest of the country. And it touched off quite a media storm around the world. And as the resident authority on Texas lunatics, there I was getting telephone calls from places like Bombay. Miss Ivins, is Bombay Times calling? Can you explain, please, the people in the Fort Davis? And I would, yeah, I can explain them. They are just crazier than shithouse rats.